Herzlich willkommen bei Spitzentitel, der Büchershow auf Spiegel.de. Mein Name ist Volker Weidermann und sein Name ist Kasu Ishiguro. Ganz herzlich willkommen. Hi, nice to be here. Ja, ein echter Nobelpreisträger. Ich bin wahnsinnig stolz und froh darauf, dass ich mit ihm sprechen kann. Sie alle kennen das Buch und den Film, was vom Tage übrig blieb, aber er hat zahlreiche Meisterwerke geschrieben. Alle fünf bis sechs Jahre kommt ein neuer Roman von ihm heraus. Der letzte richtig äh, berühmte war Alles, was wir geben mussten, auch verfilmt worden, unter anderem mit Kira Knightley. Und sein neues Buch, sein neuer Roman, der jetzt auf der ganzen Welt zeitgleich erscheint, heißt Clara und die Sonne. Ja, once again, a warm welcome, Kazu Ishiguro. Thank you very much. Very good to be with you. So how is your, first of all, how is your personal situation right now? In your, you're based in London, is that right? And you're, I know that you are usually not so happy about the PR um, task that you have to follow every five or six years that your novels are going to be published. So is there on some part a happy eye during this really fundamental bad uh, situation? No, the, the, I don't think there's anything good about this situation. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's tragic. I think it's absolutely tragic. Um, and uh, I think your country, um, you've done much better than we have. You know, we're up to 120,000 people dead, which is twice the uh, civilian dead in the Second World War. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's America is staggering, the number of deaths. I mean, so I think it's been a terrible tragedy around the world. However, you know, I have to say, um, I, I've been having a very comfortable time. You know, I don't have to go out there to work. I don't have to go into meetings. Um, my wife and I have quite a cozy life. Um, uh, we spent most of the first part of the uh, pandemic in the country where we have a little cottage. And uh, at the moment we're in London and we're watching movies and reading books. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I've now started to do this kind of publicity, which is, you know, Although you say I'm famous for not liking it, actually I, I've always secretly enjoyed um, the uh, the ability to to just take the temperature of all these different countries around the world every few years, and you meet interesting people. Um, you talk to them, you, you get an impression of what's happening in, in a way that you wouldn't if you just went as a tourist. So I I find that there's a there's a positive side to the promotion, and I always try and take as much as possible since I. Since I have to do it, I try and use it for personal research and just just to nourish my sense of what's happening in the world. Tell us a bit about the main character or the the, the storyteller actually in your book, uh, Clara. KF in uh, German and AF in the English edition, Künstlicher Freund. So who is this uh, Clara person and how did you get to know her? Well, Clara is um she's an artificial intelligent robot she looks like a little girl and she has been created like a lot of her kind for the purpose of preventing teenagers from becoming lonely and so in this world which is perhaps our present perhaps just slightly in the future uh routinely you know children or, or teenagers from around the age of you know when they're going through puberty and starting to face the problems of um adulthood, they routinely buy these machines to keep them company. They're, they become their best friends. And so that's the kind of world we're in. And so um, this novel is narrated by Clara, who is one such machine. And at the beginning, she knows nothing about the human world. She's just in the shop and she's staring out of the window, trying to learn as much as possible from this mm -hmm. little rectangle that she can see, uh, rather like the world that we have been confined to <laughs> for the last several months. And she, but she's, she's very intelligent in some ways because she's a super intelligent uh, being, but in many ways she's like a child uh, and her logic is often like a child. Um, she has a very, very restricted vision and she jumps to strange conclusions about the way human beings work, the way societies work. And she goes out into the world and she, her main task uh, becomes trying to save this family she is living with from heartbreak. She seems to have a strong emotional intelligence. How far in the future are we with uh, with this 
a novel? How much, how close to reality are we already? I think we're probably much closer to that stage than we might think. And and that, that, that's an interesting kind of question that you raised. Indeed, does Clara have emotions? Or does she just have a lot of information and algorithms about emotions? I mean, she observes human emotions so that she can understand how human beings operate. And she learns and learns and learns at a, at a huge speed because she knows that this is what she must do to carry out her mission of uh, protecting her child. Uh, but whether she has, she herself has emotions, I mean, that's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. uh, she operates like she, she has emotions. Um, so uh, I, I don't know, but, but the interesting thing about artificial intelligence at the moment, as it, and I think we're at, a, we're at a very advanced stage already, uh, and it's, I've been lucky enough to be able to meet and talk to a lot of the leading people in this field. And I think we're not talking about the kind of artificial intelligence we were uh, a few years ago, where human beings program information into a machine so that it can, it can defeat a chess champion. I mean, we're not talking about that kind of, um, we're not talking about that kind of artificial intelligence that is really controlled by humans. Uh, what happens these days, the re latest generation of machines use something called reinforcement learning. Um, where they're just given a mission and they just teach themselves. And what's interesting about this is that often we don't understand, the human beings don't quite understand how the machines have come to the conclusions that they have or what they are doing. Um, and I find this both slightly alarming and quite exciting you know, because it means that, well, for, for instance, you know, if, if an artificial intelligence machine started to write novels, yeah, I think um, it, it wouldn't write novels like, like like mine. I don't think. I think it will write an entirely new kind of literature. <laughs> yeah. Um, Have you already been in contact with it? I mean, it exists. These programs like this uh, exist uh, already. Have you been in contact with them? I mean, like the writing programs, the the, the novel writing uh, programs. Have you uh, tr uh, ever tried uh, tested them? No, no. I've never directly. Uh, encountered them and I don't think they're very ad advanced at the moment but I did have some very interesting conversations with uh, a, 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 a man that a lot of people think is a leading uh, exponent of AI in the world at the moment about the possibility of uh, a program which, which I rather jokingly called Tolstoy 3 uh, that mm -hmm. could write machines um, uh, sorry, that could, <laughs> sorry that could write novels yeah and uh, what I found interesting about this whole idea is that if a machine learns, if a, if a machine can understand empathy and human emotions, then it can probably write fiction, let us say, that, that can touch us and move us. But then I think the implications are much bigger because if the AI can understand human emotions and how to manipulate them, then it can become a very, very powerful political tool. You know, ne never mind using big data for political campaigns. If you could use artificial intelligence that thoroughly understands what people are feeling, you know, where, the, where the anger is, where the emotions are, and, and knows how to manipulate it, um, I think that could be a a very dangerous thing. Um, and so the moment a, a, an AI can write a novel that I that, that reduces me to tears, I'll be a, a very concerned about what else it can do. And it could even come up with the next big idea, you know, by big idea, I mean, an idea like, like capitalism, or, or, hmm. uh, or democracy, or money, or, or hmm in the private company, something like that, you know, it can, um, and so I think it's a, we're at a crossroads, uh, and, and already these machines are doing remarkable things. Yeah. They're doing things that human beings don't quite understand. And, and I think the people who create these things are often reverse engineering to find out how, how these things have been achieved. Yeah. And uh, you have not uh, only been in contact with, with the exper uh, experts of artificial intelligence, but w with the robots themselves? I, I, don't want to, I don't want to 
emphasize too much the artificial intelligence aspect of my novel because to some extent no, 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 you're quite right to ask me these questions because yes that my book deals with these questions uh, in a, uh, and it is a key to my to my novel that we ask the questions about you know what is a human being what is not a human being um, but also for me um, you know it, Clara this artificial being is a kind of a convenient metaphor too you know because I wanted a I wanted a creature that could almost be at the same time like a very young child like a toddler who knows very little about the world and is also like a teenager or like a who has a kind of a sibling relationship with with the girl she's looking after and then at other times she's like a parent and towards the end she's like an old person who who has completed her task of seeing her child grow up and and is rather redundant is kind of left on the heap uh, and is just left to just left to look back uh, on her memories um, and is and is rather neglected um, so it, it's a it was a way of talking about the hu the typical human lifespan just in a in the few years in the in the life of this little machine um, so yes I this forms a backdrop to my novel the, the world of artificial intelligence and and gene editing, which is also quite an important aspect of what's happening in the novel. But um, primarily for me, it's, it's about, it's a way of looking at human life. Your most famous uh, character in your work might be the Butler Stevens uh, that we all, many of us know, and the person of Anthony Hopkins. Do you see any kind of similarities between uh, Stevens and Clara? Yes, I think, I think they're both extreme outsiders um i i think i've i've always liked th this is a paradox because you know I, i'm quite a sociable <laughs> i'm quite a sociable person uh and i've always been quite embedded in in the societies that I, you know i've moved around um but when i'm writing fiction i like for me personally i think fiction is an exercise in trying to get a different perspective. I want to move out of my own perspective and try and look, try and see what the world looks like from like the, the point of view of an alien. And I think that urge has always been quite strong in me, uh, right from when I first started to write. And I think there are particular reasons for that, but I mean, and I think it's become a kind of a habit now. I'm always drawn to narrators who who are like very, you know, who are like strangers, complete strangers. Um, and Stevens the Butler was probably an early example of this. He is so odd and so much of an outsider. Um, so that you know, his perspective on the world around him, the very limitations of his vision, uh, becomes something very fascinating to me. That, that that's what I'm interested in. What he can't see as much as what he can see. I'm not interested in narrators who, who have brilliant eyes, you know, or, um, or who are omniscient. Um, I like narrators who have a very, very narrow vision. You know, I like narrators who are just, who can just see through the crack in the door and is, is drawing crazy conclusions about what's going on inside the room. That, that's the kind of narrator I like. Um, and Clara it, shares many qualities with Stevens in that respect. But I think there is an important difference. When I was writing about Stevens the Butler, that, that, that whole era in my career at the beginning, I think I did tend to focus on the failures of human beings, you know, the, the, the failings of human beings, I should say, the weaknesses, the, the possible ways in which even well-meaning, efficient people can go wrong and waste their lives. I mean, that, that was my kind of project when I was a young writer. I think Clara and, and in, in the people in my books latterly, I think they are ways of focusing, I think, on the more positive aspects of human beings. Um, and I think Clara is a much more positive character. And she, she observes the, what, what is admirable 
about human beings. And I think she takes on those qualities. And for me, to some extent, you know, she is, she's almost like a metaphor for, for the parental urge that human beings have. You know, I, th I think um, not just parental, but you know, we, we are almost programmed like machines to, to love our children and protect our children. And to some extent, to find a partner in life and protect and love that partner. Yeah, um, we're, we're programmed like that. And I think Clara is, is a machine, so she's literally programmed like that. But I, I found that quite touching, you know, that, that this is her one mission. Everything she does is to try and achieve this thing of doing the best for the child that she's looking after. You know? um, uh, th that, you know, it reminds me of my, of my own mother, you know. Um, uh, and I hope, I hope it reminds me of, of, of myself towards my own daughter, you know. Um, certainly reminds me of my my wife's attitude to my daughter. I mean, I, I think this, there are some things about human nature that that are worthy of admiration and um, and, cele and, and, and celebration. And and I think the paradox of it is that as as my the backdrops to my world have got sadder and more perhaps dystopian. The, the characters at the front have become more and more positive and they become more decent and nice. You know. An England with nice tea rooms and country houses and the war is over and everything is going forward to some, to some better era. But the characters at the front of the story are, are flawed. Um, and, um, but now I've, 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 I've kind of, maybe it's because of, I'm getting older. Um, the backdrop is sad and bleak, um, but the human beings are, are, are hopeful and um, I think they're decent. Hmm. Thank you very much indeed for your writing and for this very impressive uh, interview with you, Mr. Ishiguro. Thank you very much indeed. All the best to you. Und jetzt kommt Elke Heidenreich und ihr Spitzentitel der Woche. Mein Spitzentitel diese Woche, William Boyd Trio, im Kamper Verlag erschienen. Der Kamper Verlag legt gerade die ganzen schönen alten Boyd-Romane wieder neu auf, aber dieser ist wirklich ganz neu gerade erschienen und er spielt in Brighton und zwar 1968. Das war das Jahr, in dem der Vietnamkrieg noch tobte. In Paris gingen die Studenten auf die Barrikaden, in Amerika wurden Martin Luther King und Robert Kennedy ermordet. Nur in Brighton ist alles friedlich. Ich war mal in Brighton und zwar in dem Jahr, als... George W. Bush, der Jüngere, auch der Dümmere genannt, diesen blöden Begriff von der Achse des Bösen geprägt hatte. Und ich habe in Brighton sofort gedacht, das ist die Achse des Blöden. Da ist ein Riesenrummelplatz mit ähm, Buden und Riesenrad und allem direkt am Strand, grauenvoll. Und genau da spielt dieses Buch und genau da wird ein Film gedreht. Der Film hat den unsäglichen Titel Emily Brace Girdles, unglaublich hilfreiche Leiter zum Mond. Versteht kein Mensch, was das sein soll. Und es geht in diesem Buch um diesen Filmdreh. Am Set geht eigentlich alles schief, was schief gehen kann. Es verschwindet Filmmaterial, die Produzenten betrügen einander. Die Hauptdarstellerin heißt Annie, wird erpresst von ihrem Ex-Mann, hinter dem das FBI her ist. Und sie fängt eine Affäre an mit ihrem jungen Mitspieler, sehr jung, halb so jung wie sie. Und ähm, dabei hat sie einen Freund in Paris, dieser Freund reist irgendwann an und dann knallt es natürlich mächtig. Der Regisseur, ein windiges Börschchen namens Reggie, möchte plötzlich Rodrigo genannt und ernst genommen werden, fängt auch eine Affäre an mit der kleinen, dicken Drehbuchautorin. Im Hotel versauert ihm seine abgelegte Frau, die heißt äh, Elfrida, die war mal eine berühmte Bestsellerautorin und säuft sich jetzt so langsam zu Tode, weil es mit dem Schreiben nicht mehr klappt. Sie schafft immer die ersten drei Sätze eines neuen Romans und dann geht es irgendwie nicht weiter. Die heimliche Hauptfigur des Ganzen ist, <lacht> Entschuldigung, die Rezensentin muss auch mal husten. Die heimliche Hauptfigur ist Talbot, ein Produzent, ein sehr gütiger, sehr netter Mensch, der von seinem Kompagnon so ein bisschen betrogen und ausgenommen wird. Der versucht jeden Tag die Wogen zu glätten und hat selbst ein sehr schmerzliches Geheimnis. Er ist homosexuell. Das war 1968 noch ein Riesenthema. Er traut sich mit niemandem darüber zu reden, zumal er Frau und Kinder hat. Er traut sich schon gar nicht auszuleben. Und er ist einfach damit beschäftigt, jeden Tag dieses Chaos an diesem Set irgendwie wieder in Ordnung zu kriegen. 
William Boyd ist ein alter Romanfuchs und er schafft es, dass diese eigentlich etwas windige Story unglaublich spannend ist, weil uns diese Menschen wirklich nahe kommen, weil sie uns interessieren, weil wir sie gern haben, weil wir ihnen fast mit ihnen befreundet sind und ihnen äh, folgen dabei, was sie bei diesem Filmdreh alles erleben. Das unterhält auf 400 Seiten so, als würden wir diesen beknackten Film selber wirklich sehen. Und darum ist das mein Spitzentitel der Woche, William Boyd Trio. Und jetzt kommen wir zu den Spiegel-Bestsellern der kommenden Woche. Diese Woche auf Platz 10. Die Geschichte des geisteskranken Axtmörders Hatcher und wie er gemeinsam mit einer Alice aus einer brennenden Psychiatrie flieht. Äh, keine Ahnung, wer sowas liest. Die Chroniken von Alice heißt der Roman und geschrieben hat ihn Christina Henry. Viel Spaß dabei. Von 10 auf 9 gestiegen ist der Mann, der die Weltliteratur durch die Nacht zu uns Leserinnen und Lesern trägt. Der Buchspazierer von Carsten Henn. Und diese ganzen Bücher kann man in der Dunkelheit dann zum Beispiel hier aufstellen, damit wir für alle Zeiten genug zu lesen haben. Die Mitternachtsbibliothek von Matt Haig, diese Woche auf Platz 8. Und Platz 7 für die Geschichte eines vergangenen Glücks, der große Sommer von Ewald Ahrens. Und Steffen Kopetzky ist mit seinem schrecklich aktuellen Pockenroman aus den 60er Jahren einen Platz hinabgestiegen. Monschau, diese Woche auf Platz 6. Letzte Woche erklärte sie uns hier noch, wieso ihr Angela Merkel dringend davon abriet, Politikerin zu werden. Sie blieb Schriftstellerin. Und was für eine. Helga Schubert vom Aufstehen, Platz 4. Der neueste Streich des Rechtsanwalts Carsten Düss heißt Achtsam Morden am Rande der Welt. Auf dem Jakobsweg droht einem friedlichen Pilger der gewaltsame Tod von 0 auf 4. Das ist der Aufsteiger der Woche. Die amerikanische Road Novel aus den 80er Jahren des letzten Jahrhunderts von Benedikt Wells bleibt felsenfest auf dem Bronzeplatz. Hardland, letzte Woche 3, diese Woche 3. Und auf Platz 2 das Gedicht für eine bessere Welt, das Amanda Gorman zur Vereidigung des Präsidenten Joe Biden so phänomenal vorgetragen, vorgesungen hatte. The Hill We Climb. Spitzenreiterin bleibt die deutsche Richterin, Autorin, Wahlbrandenburgerin Juli C., mit dem Gegenstück zu ihrem früheren Erfolgsroman Unter Leuten. Über Menschen heißt der Neue, wie schon in der Vorwoche, auf Platz 1. Musik